Hi, guys. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming um, on a Friday night. Um, I know you guys are super excited to listen to Madeline Rengo, um, who's here for the Ahern workshop series. So this is the third one that we are doing this semester um, as, as a series of workshops that look at retail space and immersive environments. Um, so um, be before we start, um, let me say a few things about Madeline. Um, I know you guys are here because you know her work already, but um, let me mention a few things about Madeline um, just to um, remind you guys what the other accomplishments that she has done. Um, number one, um, Madeline founded um, Rango Studio in 2020. And um, since her, the founding of her, of her studio, she has designed retail space and um, brand identity for brands like, you guys would know Glossier, um, Stutz, um, ba 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 Bala, yes, yeah, all these amazing brands. Um, so her work has been published in um, a lot of different media magazines, um, such as Interior Design, um, Surface, um, Wallpaper, so you name it, she's there. So it's, it is really great um, that she's here to sh share her work with us. Um, number two, before Madeline started her own practice, she worked for Glossier and um, Modern Age um, as um, designers, and she also worked for the architectural offices Soil and OMA. She went to Yale for her Master of Architecture. Um, and, um, and number three, um, in addition to running her own practice, Madeline also runs a, a lecture series or dinner series called Dinners with Designers um, in New York City. And she has been hosting more than 20 dinners in two years, right? Yeah, and I, I saw that there you have a slide, so you're going to talk more about that. So that's all. So I, I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, I'm really excited to be at Syracuse this weekend. This is my first time up here, and I'm excited to get to know a lot of you and see some of your work in the workshop. Um, and yeah, so my name is Madeline. I am from Kentucky, which is where I first met Michael and Kyle when I was a student at the University of Kentucky. Um, and I actually, I have this strange memory of being at the University of Kentucky, going into your office, probably asking you for a bunch of money to do, I believe, an AIAS event, like taking a bunch of friends up to Toronto. And um, I remember you had these really beautiful glass you offered me a coffee in these beautiful glass espresso cups, and I was just like, wow, he's so cool. His office was so cool. And like, it's my dream to have those cups. <laughs> and I'm sure they're only like $40 on Amazon, but I have not managed to do that, do that yet, someday. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited uh, to be here. I'm gonna take you guys through a, about like six different projects um, that I've worked on over the past couple of years. Um, all of them kind of being within the context of like building a brand um, environment for a, a series of different, uh, typically uh, direct-to-consumer style companies. Um, but before that, I will tell you a little bit, uh, kind of something I was thinking about as you guys are like getting ready for summer internships and, and some people might be getting ready for graduation, like just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, one of the first things I did right after finishing um, my graduate degree at Yale, um, it was called Dinner with Designers. It was a, a platform that I started um, with a friend. And it really came like just kind of out of a lot of curiosity when I first finished graduate school and trying to figure out what I wanted to do, who I wanted to be, what sort of design I wanted to work on. Um, but it was also... Uh, it, essentially, it was a, a way for me to go to fancy architects' houses and uh, invite a bunch of my friends over and um, have a dinner party at their house, which was a really, I don't know, I don't know how I managed um, to organize that, but they, most of them would say yes, and we would go over and meet with them and have these lovely dinners, um, invite, you know, somewhere around 12 to 15 people, um, and really just ask them questions and get to know, be curious, and we got to hear quite a lot of really interesting stories about how they built their career. Um, and a lot of different quotes that I recall from those dinners have been quite 
uh, important to me even as I'm building my own practice and going through lots of different things. I, I think about them a lot, so I've sprinkled in throughout some of our projects, um, project images, I've sprinkled in some of those quotes and we'll kind of explain how a lot of that was so impactful for me. Um, it was also the first brand that I developed on my own and so it also was something right out of school, right out of architecture school, even though I was working within the context of architecture in terms of conversation in architecture, it was also about building a brand and building a platform and an identity and, and it allowed me to really start um, engaging in a lot of things that I hadn't done yet as a professional or as a designer, which was things like uh, learning about how to run a business and how to manage finances and how to market um, an idea and sell, uh, sell this back to the community um, and also uh, write professional emails and kind of like build something uh, of my own. So it was quite impactful. Um, and I think one of those quotes from one of those dinners by Mark Gage, the worst thing you can do with an architecture degree is be an architect. You have to grab for other things. And that's a very Mark Gage quote. He was one of a uh, professor of mine at, um, at Yale, but this really stuck with me because I feel like I've uh, always coming back to this sentence because I kind of told myself I would try to avoid becoming an architecture office. And I'm not totally sure if I'm doing that because we do a lot of architect things still. We do a lot of drawings. We do a lot of contractor uh, you know, conversations and a lot of things that are architecture. But um, we also try to think about things differently. And, and we're starting in our own team to um, begin producing our own objects and, and just kind of uh, starting to grow a little bit outside of, of quote-unquote architecture. Um, oh, yes. Okay, got it. Um, okay, so this is a photograph um, recently of our team at Ringo Studio. Um, and the reason why uh, I wanted to show this is because we recently had a team meeting across four different countries and four different time zones. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think you know, obviously coming out of the pandemic, there was a lot of um, ways that you had to work differently with each other. And so my practice started during the pandemic. Um, so we had to get comfortable designing with each other on Zoom and drawing and annotating on Zoom and like really coming up with ideas together. Um, uh, but yeah, they're a great team and uh, we have a lot of fun together. We try to go out to eat, have a drink, uh, do some partying, have fun. Um, and then we, you know, of course, take a lot of selfies in the different projects that we um, launch together. Uh, Rami's over there on the far left. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our process, and then I'm going to take you through some of, um, of the specific projects that we have worked on. Um, but ultimately, I think at Ringo Studio, we... Uh, really try to be a storyteller. We work with a brand. We try to understand what their message and what their, what their message is and who their customer is. And we really try to create a world for them, um, really pulling someone off, off the street uh, and putting them in a totally different environment um, that is a sensorial experience um, and you know, really sort of allows them to lose themselves in the space and connect with this brand on all different levels from everything they're touching to what they're smelling to what they're seeing and listening to. So I'm going to take you through a couple of these different projects. Um, and I'd first kind of just like to put this up on the screen and talk a little bit about this is kind of like our pillars that we discuss in the studio together about the things that we feel really create uh, an experiential brand um, environment. So making sure that we're thinking about sound, smell, light, texture, really a sensorial experience. Often brands um, really need to create a, a customized experience for their, for everyone that's walking in the door to make you feel like you, know, you are truly um, welcome as a customer and you're having a special uh, you know, custom experience with the brand uh, that you're being taken care of. And of course, opportunity to discover new things about the brand. Um, sometimes we are often translating those stories locally to engage with the different climates and the different context of where the store may be. Um, and of course, offering a place for community in, in those transactional spaces has always been an important part of our work. Um, content is just you know, a, a thing that is kind of mandatory these days in the way people experience brands. Um, and then 
you know, really making sure that our design is both beautiful for the customer, but also beautiful and easy for the people operating the store, because if they're not um, enjoying themselves in the space, the customer is also not going to have a good experience. Um, and then really taking that design all the way from the whole environment, but down to some very small touch points so that the brand look and feel really comes at all different scales. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Glossier, just briefly, because it was certainly, this was one of my, um, maybe my, my third or fourth job outside of graduate school, and I was uh, working with them in-house as um, the designer of a bunch of their pop-ups that they launched in 2019, 2020. And this experience was pretty foundational for me because it was the first time I left an architecture office and went into another company, a tech company, um, and really uh, surrounded, you know, I was surrounded by creative directors, art directors, marketing teams, finance teams, um, brand designers, and it was a lot different, the types of conversations that we would have um, than what I was experiencing inside of an architecture office. Um, and, you know, working with those stores and figuring out how that design might influence the rest of the company, might influence a marketing launch or a campaign or even a, an object that they create. And it was also really the, the first kind of moment when a light bulb went off in my head and I realized um, that even though I had, you know, was quite new to my professional career, um, I was really able to make, uh, make architecture and make a space and, and design. Um, and it was an opportunity for me to really kind of flex and, and have leadership, and it allowed me to grow a lot and allowed me to be really confident as a designer, um, really working through these concepts and, and having a team and a company that was allowing me to really run with my ideas and support those and really kind of, uh, you know, really like let me do whatever I wanted in the design, which was really an incredible experience. This was the Glossier Atlantis store. Um, it was meant to, uh, have a nod to some of the music industry that they have in Atlanta. And so the image on the left here being a representation of um, speakers and light and allowing this kind of wall structure uh, both to be the backdrop for photos but also to kind of communicate the concept of music being such an important part of Atlanta's um, culture. And then in other rooms, the walls were covered in these acoustical panels uh, that were cut in the wavy pattern that is kind of the iconic shape for the Glossier visual merchandising. And so you kind of had this duality between um, these rooms that were very sort of drywall and sculptural, and then these rooms that were meant to sort of be insanely textural and kind of engulf you in a different way. And of course it was here during these that I learned a lot about how to um, create architecture that and, and design that would um, go viral on the internet in a way, like curating those images and, and really thinking about how customers come into stores with a phone in their hand and how they take pictures and how um, those pictures in those stores was a reflection that going to a retail space in the last couple of years has been almost like a cultural um, event. Uh, it's a destination for people in cities. It's, it's somewhere where they go with their friends. It's um, not a transactional space anymore, but it's a place for you to kind of go and participate. Um, and so this quote from Keller Easterling, there are spatial variables everywhere that one can work on. Most things that are happening in the world are embedded in space. And I think this is important because it, it, it speaks to, uh, you know, everything, every company, so many different companies, even ones that you might not realize right now, um, have a need for architectural thinking in so many different ways. And I think um, going into Glossier, it was a little bit of a jump for me, and I didn't even know what that company was, never had heard of the makeup before, uh, but it was a, you know, I, I was working with a, a tech company that needed an architectural thinker on the team, and I think that's really important as you go out into the world to, um, to sort of realize the skills that you have as, uh, as a thinker and as a creative and how diverse they can be as you apply that to different types of companies and different industries. So the next store that I'm going to tell you about is for a brand called Modern Age. Um, it is a healthcare clinic based in New York. It is um, New York's first aging wellness destination. And um, it was a, 
uh, it's a special project for me because it was a, a brand and a company that I began working with when all they had was a blank piece of paper. So they didn't have a name, they didn't have a logo, um, they didn't have a color palette, they didn't even necessarily know exactly who their customer was or what their service offering was gonna, going to be. But it was about, um, they knew they needed a physical environment to offer services to people, and so uh, that's why I was brought on to make sure that from the very start of the brand building, that the physical space was considered as uh, like a very critical part of that customer experience. So we began with a color palette and a textural palette. Um, you know, of course the healthcare industry has uh, maybe, you know, always been a little bit sort of boring or scary or not a place that you would necessarily think of to be designed. But um, going to a space, especially when you're talking about very vulnerable conversations such as your age or health concerns that you have, we really wanted to make sure that the customer, through the architecture and through the space, w w had a sense of like joyfulness and had a sense of playfulness and, and relaxation. So you can see um, this is the, the front facade. It, it was right on Fifth Avenue. Uh, it was very open. So instead of creating a space that was private and closed off and maybe, maybe made you feel shameful for going in or, or like you were trying to hide behind something, we opened it up and really allowed it to be a celebration. You come into the front lobby and you have textures of beautiful uh, sort of painterly textures on the wall um, mixed with uh, some stainless steel textures to kind of nod to more um, hygienic textures, uh, as well as some terracotta tile that was really um, speaking to the idea of, you know, each person kind of is aging and, and growing their own way and their own path, and some of these more handed and more um, natural textures were representative of you know, that idea that each person is kind of on their own unique aging journey. Um, and I think what was interesting about this project is it was a little bit of a departure from retail specifically, but um, a lot of people think that Ringo Studio only does retail, and we do a lot of retail, but I always answer that question with, we approach any project, whether it's a healthcare clinic, whether it's um, a stage design, whether it's a, a retail store, in the same way we think about the customer, we think about the experience, we, we put together a story and a mood board, um, and we build that out regardless of the typology. Um, so some really, some favorite parts in this project were uh, really just kind of being able to play with the geometries. Um, I showed you the logo at the very beginning. Uh, this was kind of my inspiration for the architectural form in the space. You can see kind of all of these um, curves that are partnered with these like very sharp points. And so as I was working through the design, even the floor plan, it kind of has a lot of those moments where you see um, like a, a curve kind of coming to a sharp point or um, a, an archway sort of being uh, chopped um, with a sharp edge. Uh, and so a lot of, a lot of the brand, uh, like literally the logo was very inspirational as I was building, um, building out the design of this space. And then of course bringing color and bringing playful moments like, um, like a light changing feature, sculptural feature on the ceiling that would you know, allow someone when they were in the chair to, to really feel um, relaxed and calm while they were having a procedure. We also curated the space with um, beautiful art all over the walls. It, all of the art had a theme of time and aging. And so, you know, everything from not just the, the textures and the materiality, but also the art had, um, had the same story that thread through each piece. Um, and this is the, the, the refresh station. It's kind of where the customer passes through after they've had a treatment. And it's really just meant to be like a space um, purely for the customer and purely for the sake of beauty. Um, you know, it's well, well lit with this kind of soft light going across the top, um, the top ceiling and then the beautiful terracotta tiles both on the walls but also on the floor uh, and then just a really soft glow around the mirrors and um, it's stocked with things like chocolates and breath mints and uh, makeup remover and all sorts of little things for someone just to like put themselves back together before they walk out into the busy streets of New York. Um, I'll flip through these quickly, but this is 
uh, the second location for modern age. So you can see different, different site, totally different size, but you can start to see how the brand um, begins to be a kit of parts that they can begin to replicate and scale across many cities. So same thing with the curves and the textures on the wall and, and the artwork, um, but a totally different space, uh, but with that same branded aesthetic. And, and I think this, this location really showed to them that they did have an identity that was unique to them, but also something that they could scale across multiple locations, which is, of course, what most retail clients um, are in need of. They don't want to just open one store, they want to open many. Um, this, this is one of my favorite parts of the project. It's a photo booth. Um, everyone that comes in has to take uh, clinical photos of their face uh, and the back of their head and their hair just to kind of assess uh, where they're currently at. But when I was working on this, like some of the things that we work on is not just the design, but also the technology or the sort of uh, the, the technology experience of the space. So how do we make this photo booth also a reflection of the brand? So we decided to um, add a moment at the end, build it into the custom, uh, custom flow of the technology where after you take your clinical photos, it asks you to have, uh, take a moment and like celebrate yourself and like take a bunch of fun photos. Um, you know, it's like literally a selfie station, but I'd like to think maybe a, a bit more chic. And so afterwards it texts you this kind of vintage looking photo strip. Um, and it's, yeah, meant to be something, you know, you're coming in to talk about your age, your health, but you kind of get to come away with this moment where you're celebrating yourself where you are in time and um, really kind of uh, being joyful about, about your aging process. Um, okay, so this is a, a project that we just finished construction on actually like two days ago. Um, it just opened on March 1st. Rami worked with us on this project um, for a little bit and uh, contact sports. So the quote that I, I have for this project is from Martha Schwartz. I've always thought that the best thing to do is not to have clients, but just to have patrons. And um, I remember when she told me this, I didn't quite understand what she meant. But after working with certain clients and particularly with um, contact sports, uh, I very much understand that you know the, we worked with contact sports Actually, we started maybe a year and a half ago, um, and this client very much valued design and very much valued our expertise and our contribution to his brand building. This brand did not exist at all when we started working with them. All they had um, was a name. That was it. They didn't have the color palette, the logo, or anything like that. They really just came to us with an idea, and the idea was to um, create a sexual wellness uh, sex toy store. Um, in Soho that was going to feel like a luxury shopping experience and was going to sort of break the taboo that people have over shopping for sex toys and shopping for intimate, uh, intimate objects and really bring a, bring a, uh, a level of design um, and experience to that. And so we went through actually two different versions of the store. We actually got all the way finished with the design once and then we were ready to submit it for construction and then the client uh, said, you know what? I think we need to start over. <laughs> and so that's why we call him our patron because he just continued to provide us with work and with opportunity to, to keep designing. Um, so this store, uh, you know, if you think about maybe what you typically would find in a city if you're going to a sex toy store, it's, it's very um, uh, maybe scandalous, it's not, it's not well designed, it's maybe um, not well lit, uh, it's just kind of items sort of mixed all over the shelves and it's very, could be a very overwhelming experience. Um, this brand particularly wanted to think about sex through the lens of sports um, and contact sports and, and allow it to be something that's really more playful and uh, not as intimidating to talk about. And so there's a lot of nods that they make to different uh, sports games and um, even scenes uh, such as a locker room and uh, kind of even this like nostalgic vintage aesthetic of, of like sort of old sports jerseys. Um, so this is one of our material palettes. I don't know if you can see it that well, but we always make a material palette and photograph it at the end of the project because it gives us a little, uh, a little sort of reminder of, of the material story that we put together. Um, this one, particularly the, the brand's logo, had a rose in it um, the second time around. And so uh, the colors of the store really became this like 
burgundy, dark, sort of vintage green, um, and then it was partnered with uh, the texture of a wood veneer throughout the whole space. Um, and the wood veneer is, is really kind of represent, represent, rep, uh, sorry, representing of um, a locker room space. There was something that the client was really interested in about a kind of, uh, I guess kind of just like the experience of changing your clothes, like literally changing your clothes in front of other people in a locker room as you're getting ready for your sports activities and that kind of experience that you have perhaps in your younger years as you're starting to get familiar with your sexuality. And, and that was a, a, a thing that he really wanted to uh, lean into in this project. Um, so this is the a drawing of the facade. A lot of times when we work with clients, um, this is an example of kind of like stuff that we make that then becomes branded merch for, for their store. So taking one of our drawings, taking one of our renderings, and being inspired uh, by it to create a product um, from that to further the brand story. These are all renderings, but there's a couple in progress construction photos at the end. Uh, but it's quite dark, so I'm not sure if you can really see it, but it is, it's made out of uh, a lot of wood and a lot of uh, dark moody colors. Um, there's a rose shop in the very front, almost like a little bit of a speakeasy vibe. You can come in and get a rose um, and, uh, and a candle, or you can pass through the rose shop and, and start shopping for all of the intimate products. Um, the brand's merchandise is displayed throughout the space, but it's also mixed in with um, sports sort of gear and uh, things like trophies and, and vintage basketballs and helmets. And um, along with some of those vintage objects, uh, we also kind of, you know, leaned into the brand in other cases by creating like custom rugs and custom signage for them and, and really kind of uh, tried to create this, uh, yeah, like a nostalgic locker room feeling, but also very functional as a retail experience. This is the back area after you pass through the locker room, you kind of, um, the space opens up into a, a lounge where you can kind of hang out a little bit more, try on some sweatshirts, um, speak to a, you know, a customer uh, service rep and, and like learn more about the products. Um, but very different looking than other uh, sex toy stores in New York. I mean, I, actually when they came to us with this prompt, I was quite blown away that there was no other sex toy store in New York that had attempted to be kind of a well-designed space. Uh, so I, I'm really excited to see where this one goes and, and to see how customers, um, yeah, react to that and how that starts to change the taboo uh, for that shopping experience. These are some photos that we took on our phone the other day. We did like a custom mosaic tile, um, which was the most painful vendor I've ever worked with. But uh, there we go, we have it. It was supposed to be red, but now it's black. Um, and a bunch of, uh, they've, uh, they, the brand made like tube socks and towels and they've got it um, it's kind of stocked with some vintage magazines. Um, and then I think uh, something that we, an, another sort of thing that we really had a challenge with on this project was the, the gridded ceiling. Um, I don't really know how it came together in the end, but it was such a, such a heavy object and we had to go through lots of different tests and studies to understand how the ceiling was gonna be hung and how the lights would work. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really complicated, but actually turned out to be really a lovely element in the space. And some other photos, um, this is the store right as it's opening, they've got the roses, they're filling in the rose buckets with roses. We, we did a custom neon sign to match their logo. Um, and then of course some branding on the front window. Okay, so the next, the next, am I over time or am I good? Okay. The next uh, project that I want to tell you about is another one that we recently completed in January. Rami also worked with us on this project. Um, but uh, the brand's Our Place is a homewares, wait, oh, sorry, I thought that was my phone. It's a, a home, home and kitchen brand. Um, and they make, uh, I'm gonna say this wrong, but it's either the perfect pot or the, the perfect pan and the always pot, <laughs> something like that. Uh, but they're really famous for, I think it's this one right here. Um, it's probably very similar to a lot of other pots and pans that you may be able to buy, but they have really incredible social media marketing and they've really connected with their, their customer in terms of creating like a lifestyle brand 
related to the concept of cooking and bringing people together in your home and uh, really celebrating the idea that food, bringing people together over food can be a really meaningful way to connect. Um, so a lot of storytelling opportunities with a brand like this. Um, and I think the, the types of things that we wanted to highlight was that idea of home and that idea of like a domestic space. Um, uh, well, firstly, their pots and pans also come in a really, really beautiful palette. So this is an example of a brand that came to us with a style guide with um, sort of a whole look and feel that they had already established. And it was our responsibility not to overpower that, but to find a way to translate those, um, those branded elements and complement them um, and make sure that the architecture really celebrated the product and didn't compete with it or didn't, um, you know, wasn't saying a different message. So a beautiful color palette to work with. And within that color palette, um, we decided to basically fit out the entire interior in ceramic tile. Um, so we did a lot of, lot of color matching. We, at some point, I think I had like thousands of tiles in my apartment, just constantly checking out different ones, making sure they were in stock, making sure they were available, checking the color with, um, with the product and, and making sure it was the right fit. Um, and uh, really, I think the process of finding the right tile took like, I don't know, four or five weeks of just constant reordering different samples. Um, but eventually, we came up with this palette. Uh, it had some light wood textures. Um, it had some sort of ceramic tiles, but also these wavy ceramic tiles, some beautiful sheer uh, curtains. Um, and, and really, we wanted the space to feel as if you were walking through someone's kitchen. So I wanted to show you this terrible drawing, uh, because um, this is how we work at Ringo Studio a lot when we're on Zoom. Um, we do have an office space now, but uh, oftentimes we don't go in, or sometimes we're on four different continents, and uh, we do a lot of design work over Zoom collectively, and um, we make these terrible annotative drawings, but this is how I started my office in this digital Zoom space. So instead of being able to sketch right next to someone, we had to find a way to do that sketching digitally. And so these drawings are, are like literally the worst, but also at the same time, like they get us to the finish line um, and get us to the ideas that we're trying to communicate. Uh, so somehow, after all of these terrible sketches, um, we got a store out of it, which was great. And you can see some of the textures. We've got this um, checkered pattern at the top, which was something that we were seeing a lot in their branded campaign imagery, like tablecloths and uh, kind of that picnic-y uh, look and feel. So we put that on the dropped ceiling, and we partnered that with um, tiles and these swooping gestures on the walls. And then a lot of the uh, millwork fixtures themselves also are covered in tile. And you can see it has a little bit of like, it's styled with. Uh, like a sense of being in someone's home, um, being kind of in an intimate space, uh, seeing objects kind of uh, lightly styled on, on the counters and, and really um, finding a way to make those products pop even though we've got a very saturated tile palette, the products still really shine in the space. Um, and I think, like every project, we have an interesting thing to learn about. Something. This was the first project we had done where there was so much tile in the space. And I think um, now we all know how to very, uh, very specifically detail tile. Um, which took a, it was a nice learning for our team, but now we're champions at it. Um, but yeah, just you know, playful, playful shapes and playful geometries, but ultimately to merchandise the product um, in a way that was both shoppable, but also allowed the customer really to wander through the space and kind of get lost in an idea of a dinner party or an idea of um, gathering over food. Um, so in the main, uh, the main area, there was like a large table um, that was styled as if it was prepared for a dinner. Um, and then you see this little room off in the back. Um, this was the kind of surprise moment. Uh, it was called the Room of Wonders. And uh, we definitely went through 1,000, uh, 500 million iterations of what this tiny, like, four by four foot room was going to be. Um, but ultimately, we took some inspiration from different artists uh, and a lot of things that, you know, we've seen with, like, infinity mirrors. And we decided to um, kind of really push this idea of 
uh, a brand message that the client had, which was building a bigger table uh, for everyone to sit at. And so literally, the mirrors, um, the, you know, the table ends here, and you can see the other line of the mirror over there, uh, but the reflection becomes an infinity space, so when you're in there, the table is just endless in all directions. Okay, so the last um, project I will talk about, it's kind of two projects, um, but it's for a client called Bala. Um, and the quote that I was thinking about related to this project is, um, work with people that have integrity, which is Wendy Evans-Joseph said this at, while we were at her home for dinner. And um, I used to work with Wendy, and she was definitely like a really in, important mentor for me and still is. Um, and I think this quote is really important because you can take a lot of different jobs as a designer um, and you can work for a lot of different people. Maybe some of them pay you more, maybe some of them pay you less, maybe the jobs are cool or not cool. Uh, but at the end of the day, if the people that you're working for don't have integrity and don't value design, you um, will really struggle with that experience. And it takes some time to really understand your boundaries of within uh, that context as you're growing as a professional, but I always come back to this um, as I'm beginning a project or as I'm meeting a potential new client or as, um, you know, as I'm kind of thinking about are we going to engage with them and work on something with them, but this is always a good gut check is to make sure that the, the people that you're working with um, are special. And the Bala team, in, in fact, these clients were incredible. And so uh, I always think about how wonderful they were to work with and um, really their brand mission was something that that was just so great and easy to celebrate and get behind as a designer. So if you don't know their products, um, they make these beautiful, playful fitness products. Um, their brand mission is to really change the way people think about exercise and about fitness. Um, and a, design a set of products and a, kind of create the opportunity for a lifestyle that doesn't have to be about going to the gym every day and getting on a treadmill or going to Equinox. Um, but it's really about things that you can do in your own home, simple things. You can put the, the weights on and go for a walk. Um, you can, a lot of their campaign imagery there, sometimes they have the ankle weights on or the arm weights on and they're drinking a glass of wine and just like the up and down of getting it to your mouth is, uh, is, can be exercise. Um, but I think what I was so excited about when I met these clients, um, I was using their product imagery in mood boards for other clients and I was so obsessed with, um, with their brand and their look and feel. And after just kind of like obsessing over it for so long, I just decided to reach out to the founders directly on LinkedIn and I was like, hey, I love your products. I'm like so, uh, you know, into the, the sort of world that you're creating and I can see a, an architectural story that complements that and I, I want to make that for you. Um, and to my surprise, they were like, cool, let's do it. <laughs> And then about two weeks later, we had three projects lined up with them, which was um, like definitely some weird luck. But I guess the lesson there is to just uh, put yourself out there. And if you want something, ask for it and go get it. And uh, it probably will work out. So these are the founders, um, Max and Natalie. Uh, they were truly a joy to work with and just really lovely people. Um, and yeah, and, and I think like our design approach at Ringo Studio really meshed well with both their playful aesthetic but also uh, their personalities. Um, so we came up with a palette that was uh, pretty straightforward uh, as it related to their brand textures. Um, and I think the most important part about this project was the exact paint colors. Um, there's always something that, that we, when we were working through a project, that we get really hung up on, either the client or us, in, in trying to perfect it. But in, in this particular case, um, it was the color palette. And of course, you can see that the store is wildly colorful. And uh, it was very sort of nerve-wracking to put those um, specifications on a drawing sheet and then um, wait for it to be done and hope that it looked right together. But I think you know, we kind of took a leap with it and it came out really well. Um, and the, the color palette was really complementary um, to their products. And it was also meant to relate back to a, a digital campaign that they were working on. So, so the color was really important in this project. But then the other thing that you can see in this space is that we actually have um, blown up in scale all of their 
uh, or some of our favorites of their product line and, and made these kind of like sculptural elements in the space, uh, really kind of just to create an environment that um, was about play and was about movement and, and really um, had a lot of like gestural moments in it so that when you came into the space, it was a space that encouraged movement. Um, which was ultimately what they were trying to do as a brand, give people the tools to move in the way that they wanted to move. Um, and so when you come off the street, you enter through this uh, large kind of um, power, it was their power ring that's kind of shoved between two walls. Um, and you see a display of their merchandise on the left, uh, and then you have the bar, uh, which we were kind of thinking about as like the genius bar in a way, um, relating to kind of some of the, the way that Apple creates that bar where people can go and get information. These products are not typical exercise products, so the customer really needed to be educated on how to use them in some cases. Um, the other thing that we did in this space is we covered the perimeters in mirror to lean, uh, lean into the idea of it, of it being a fitness studio. Um, a lot of you know, fitness studios, yoga studios, ballet studios, you would have a wall of mirror. And so we kind of um, brought that into the environment to, to again like bring the mind back to that idea. And this was definitely our most favorite. Um, it was a giant blow up of their bangles, which is um, their top selling product, but it, it was also meant to kind of be this like iconic photo moment for anyone that came into the space. Yeah, and I think what I, um, what I really loved about this was kind of just like the characters that these objects began to take on, like this, this wiggly beam that's like leaning softly up against the wall, like uh, they, they have, they embody these kind of personalities when you look at them. Um, and, you know, there's definitely moments in the space where there's like very literal merchandising, um, but otherwise you were mostly meant to be immersed in a brand idea. It was, again, like significantly less important to the transaction, but it was much more of a marketing uh, platform for them. They were uh, coming to New York. They were in Soho. This, this store was in Soho, and it was going to be the first time that they had ever done a physical retail store. So a lot of people um, were coming in here and have never heard of the brand before. They're based in Los Angeles. So uh, I think from a, from a sort of a business success standpoint, they received a lot of new customers and they gathered a lot of new emails, um, which I think you know, really set them up um, as they were getting ready to kind of explore other markets. In the back of the space, we had, uh, uh, inspired by one of their campaign images, we had a very sort of lush and textural um, pink space. The whole space was entirely different shades of the same color. Um, and you can see in the back there were some um, cabinets here for when they would host yoga classes or, or workout classes. People could store their things directly um, up, you know, amongst the merchandise and there were some changing rooms also uh, among the merchandise. Um, and then again, some, some large overscaled objects and these uh, walls of mirror where people could grab the product and start testing it out and seeing how their body was moving and seeing how you could interact with these objects. Um, so this was kind of our catalog of, of parts. Um, and the little sort of uh, personalities that went into the store. Um, in this project, we worked with a scenic mill worker, so um, someone who usually designs sets or theaters. And uh, actually, those are my favorite fabricators to work with because they have just as creative as a, a mind as as we do as designers, and they're they're always yes people. They can you can give them any concept, any idea, any weird sketch, and they will figure out how to make it, and they usually do it way faster than all other carpentry mill workers. So we work with um, a lot of uh, fabricators in New York that are responsible for some of the big fashion show sets that you might see, um, just because they understand how to work really fast and they understand how to create textures that are not as typical in interiors. Um, yeah, and then a couple images here. When we came into this project, we knew that the space was, um, that it was important that they could bring people back into the space, bring their community in, bring influencers, friends of the brand, and host classes in the space. Uh, so the millwork was designed so that it could be rolled out of the room into another area and that you could fit um, a 20-person yoga class inside. And so that's what they did every, like, a couple times a week and on weekends, they hosted classes in the morning and the evening. Um, and it was pretty incredible to take a yoga class 
in a space like that. Um, I did one or two classes myself there, and I think actually the thing that I regret the most in the design is that when you're doing yoga, you're actually looking at the ceiling a lot. And we didn't design the ceiling. So that was my big uh, lesson learned there. Part of, partly that was because of budget, but you can see these terrible track lights on the top left. Um, uh, so yeah, next time we do this, we will start with the ceiling first. Um, but you can see how the space really became this like content moment for their brand. It was all about bringing uh, fitness influencers in and, and really giving them access to the space and allowing people to come into the space and partner with the brand and, and kind of um, use it to host their own story. Um, and I think that was actually quite an interesting business learning for the brand as well. They didn't realize so many people would want to book the space, but a lot of their um, kind of, uh, a lot of their, I guess, money that happened from the store came from outside brands that wanted to book a class for their own customers in the space. And so that was kind of an interesting and unexpected um, turn of events. And some of them have actually reached out to me, even though the store has been closed for, for many months, they have reached out to me and asked if they can still book the store, which kind of got me thinking like, maybe we should, be des maybe we should design our own fitness space and then uh, allow people to book it out. But you can see here that just the simple floor plan of being able to uh, shift um, and do a bunch of uh, workout classes inside. So then the last thing that I'll tell you about is um, same brand, Bala. Um, but when we first started working with them, we knew that they were getting ready to launch a second pillar to their business. So they were designing all of these beautiful um, fitness objects, uh, but it was also during the pandemic and people were not going to yoga studios and going to fitness studios, um, people were starting to think about online fitness and, and digital classes. And so um, they wanted to create their own online virtual classes, but they wanted uh, that visual uh, of whatever you would see on the screen to really, um, oh yeah, here we go, the video worked, yeah, to really, uh, be connected to their brand. Um, I think if you watch a lot of online video classes, you know, whether it's Allo Yoga or Apple or some of these other ones, they all kind of look, they have the same background, they have the same kind of look and feel, it looks very fitnessy. Uh, but this was meant to be like a totally different world, um, the Bala size world, and it was meant to be very loud and be very colorful. Um, and I think, you know, this was a very simple architectural project in a way, um, or actually the, res the result what we came to. It's just a small, um, a small stage, a couple, of, uh, a couple of sort of geometries carved out. There was a, a, a pool in, in the front to kind of bounce light and texture, and a couple of abstract props. Um, the, the back screen um, was changeable so that they could come up with uh, different environments. Um, and I think the thing that we really learned about this project was um, the lighting really made a huge impact on how much content they were able to get out of this single design. So every angle that they took from, every angle that they decided to shoot a different series from, they could wash the whole set in a different color, change the background, change a couple props around, and immediately they had a variation of their content, which allowed them to shoot over like, I don't know, maybe 300 different videos um, on, on their website, which you can see. Uh, you, I think it might even be free, so you can kind of go online and um, pick your class and uh, from the convenience of your home, do a yoga class in a Ringo Studio environment. And yeah, that's the last project. Um, uh, yeah, and I think, you know, we definitely have a lot of fun when we work. We have a lot of, um, a, a lot of play with colors and textures and, and stories and putting these worlds together. But I think a, lo a lot of that is also complementary from the brands that we get to work with. They come to the table with all of these different ideas and then we get to gather those ideas and sort of uh, put, uh, put them back on the table through an architectural lens. And I think, um, yeah, it was, it was not necessarily something that I, I thought I would be doing, sort of working in a retail environment or uh, working in the retail industry, but it's really become quite, um, quite an opportunity both to create a sense of like public art and public sculpture, um, but also, uh, yeah, really just to, uh, to kind of connect with customers in a space um, that can be quite impactful 
to their life and to the way that they connect with other brands, which in our sort of social media world, um, brands can be quite powerful in, in the way that communities come together. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that's all for the images. Thank you so much, Madeline. That was amazing. And thank you so much for sharing the breadth of your work. Um, it's really fun to see all these um, amazing sculptural form and think about how they relate to a brand identity. So I'm just curious, how many of you have been to spaces that Madeline designed? Glossier, maybe? Yeah, here. Do you guys have any questions? Hello, Madeline. Um, so you talked a lot about how um, you kind of help brands design their own brand or their retail space, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the branding for Ringo Studio, like Ringo Studio's mm. color palette, the font, um, Yeah, what goes into that? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, that's been really a fun uh, exercise over the last two years. Um, we have a like an external brand team that we work with uh, quite closely. Um, it's two girls that went to Yale for graphic design and they now have a branding studio. Um, and I met them through a friend and I, uh, I really wanted to invest in the Ringo Studio brand and make it something special. And, but I also didn't want to attempt to do it myself because um, sometimes when you're you know, running a business or, or sort of working on such a large project, um, it's better to hire an expert to help you and participate in the conversation as opposed to feeling like you have to do all, every part of it yourself. So we worked with a brand team um, and yeah, they really kind of, I just handed them a ton of photographs of our projects and they sort of put this world together with a set of pastel, um, pastel colors and they made us a, a really beautiful logo that relates to some of the curvature in our architecture. And um, yeah, it's, it's been fun and I think, as we keep going, we've started, and, and the, the crew that's taking the workshop tomorrow will get more of a peek into this, but we've started to do some fun things, like um, we designed a line of studio merch for our team, which uh, somehow, because of minimums in production and quantities, became like a massive amount of merchandise that is now in my studio apartment. <laughs> Just arrived yesterday, and so, uh, now, because of that problem, we have decided to tackle the idea of creating a campaign for these objects um, and figuring out how to do our own art direction and, and do our own photography and, uh, you know, really allow it to be like the first stepping stone of um, stepping stone kind of going outside of interior design or architecture and starting to put those design ideas and skills into an object or into a line of fashion or clothing or... Um, maybe some other furniture items and things like that. Thank you. So you kind of um, started producing things during like COVID and a lot of it was done digitally. And I think it's really interesting like talking about these amazing spaces that you're designing um, and with the idea of like spaces and branding in the digital age, there's also a lot of talk sometimes about like the metaverse. And I was just wondering if you thought that that was something that was a bit more like gimmicky or if you thought that the metaverse actually was, is actually like a, holds a lot of interesting and promising opportunities for the future. Yeah, somebody um, asked me about uh, that kind of metaverse digital space yesterday and uh, as well. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, my, I guess my answer to it was, it's very intriguing, but it hasn't felt right for us as a team or as a studio to get involved in it. Um, and I think that there's, the reason behind that is because we're so excited by the physical, textural, tactile experience of going into these stores, everything from the smell and the light quality and, and the textures that you get to touch and walk around on. Yeah, no, I think um, it's really interesting and I'm sure you could do the type of work that we're doing at like, you know, a hundred times the scale and produce it much faster and create, you know, so many more iterations over it. But uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not personally interested in trying it for some reason. Maybe that's I'm getting older and I'm not, I hit my capacity of technology. But I will say on that note that I'm quite interested in the conversations and the readings um, and articles that I've seen about 
generative AI and how, and how people are, you know, using uh, mid-journey and apps like that to um, input verbal language and then get imagery. So we've we've been playing around, or I've been playing around with that a little bit in our studio, and we just decided to um, host an internal seminar on it. So somebody on our team is going to give a presentation, and we're all going to download the thing and start playing with it and see um, if it actually becomes part of our workflow. So in that sense, we will start creeping into that world a bit. Sorry, thanks. Yeah, your work is really fascinating. Um, so I have kind of a two-part question that I think they both come out of like the origins of your practice starting with COVID. I think one being that um, there's such a huge advent and like explosion of e-commerce and online shopping. So, um, you know, I wonder, you know, like uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit in your last example, like, but how much of your branding and design finds its way to like web type experiences? Yeah. And then, um, you know, given that a lot of retail experience is happening online, you know, what, what do you see as like the current state of the physical retail experience and where it might be going in the future compared to how it's been in the past? Yeah, um, I think a lot of people maybe thought that like retail was going to be dead or that uh, it was going to, you know, that what we experienced during the pandemic was going to um, really change the way people shopped for items. But truly in the industry, they've seen quite the opposite, um, that since cities have opened back up, people have been shopping like crazy in retail stores. And, and I think a lot of people ask me things like, how did you launch a retail focused design studio during the pandemic, uh, like literally November of 2020. Um, but we had, we never had, uh, we never ran into an issue of people wanting to slow down from a physical space standpoint. We actually had a bunch of clients that were like, uh, particularly studs is one that I'm thinking of that was really eager to find ways to get people back into the stores and out of their homes because they were so desperate to go to a different environment. Um, and particularly the example at studs, uh, you know, you can't get your ears pierced online. And um, I think that's maybe one thing that, uh, that I sort of, in retrospect, have seen a trend is that a lot of retail spaces are not just offering a product, but they're hosting a class inside their retail space or they're offering ear piercing along with purchasing jewelry or uh, Modern Age, for example, is uh, um, an aging clinic that you have to come in and get a blood, blood draw or you have to come in uh, and get a treatment. So I think, um, yeah, I think it definitely changed the way people um, were programming their retail spaces. Yeah, does that answer your question? I think I might have gone off, but yeah. Um, I really enjoy the presentation and I love the color palettes that's like in the beginning of every project. And I've been thinking about this question um, of like communicating with professionals versus communicating with clients who might not know the both the literal language and the representational language that we use usually in studio. So I want to ask, like, um, how does, like, I guess, communicating with the clients kind of influence the way to represent your concepts as the design process moves on? Because mm -hmm. I feel like the renderings are really powerful, but OK, I'm <laughs> I guess <laughs> I'm seeing some ideas now. But like, how do you present, like, the um, very original form of the ideas mm -hmm. to the client? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, there's, we've experienced with the clients that we work with, um, we work directly with the CEOs of these companies. So often our design presentations, you know, the companies that we work for are very small. They're, they're new direct to consumer companies. They're, they're quite a small internal team. They're a startup. Um, and so where our initial conversations are directly with the, the creative directors, the CEOs, the founders of these companies, and they have 
so much creative vision because they've ultimately built a brand or have had, um, I guess, the passion to build one if they haven't started it yet. So they are very much creative, um, not necessarily through the lens of architecture, but we really have a lot of overlap in terms of the way we think about, at least the way that Ringo Studio thinks about sort of communicating in a narrative and a branded space. Um, they really participate in that conversation with, a lot, with us a lot. Sometimes they have way too many ideas for us and it gets, uh, you know, we have to like shut them, shut them out a little bit. But, um, but, you know, this is an example of, you know, sometimes they'll come to the table with, the, you know, a brand deck and they'll have these images. And so we can immediately start thinking about a sense of playfulness, a sense of attitude, a sense of um, repetition and pattern. and. Um, uh, and, and kind of some of the stories and messages that they, they want to share. And so, you know, taking that world, uh, this very kind of playful, um, even kind of the shape of their logo, and then turning it into an architectural element that goes into their space. Or um, taking some of those, uh, like if you can see these, um, these kind of like icons that they were using in their, um, in their branding and, and kind of in their own merch, we started um, creating, bringing those back into kind of some of the architectural details in the space. Um, so I think usually it's really lovely to work with these types of clients that um, aren't familiar with architecture because it allows our conversations to be much more rich and much more diverse and they force us to communicate back differently and I think it helps us to make a more... Um, uh, kind of diverse and a more rich palette when we're thinking about the design. I was just going to show you one that was very literally a translation of their graphics. This was a very silly, um, quick pop-up that we did in Boston, but um, for some reason everyone always asks, every client that I work with, they always want me to design a pop-up in these same huts. I've done so many and I really dislike them, but it just keeps coming back and haunting me. But we use, you know, we use their, took their patterns, we find ways to kind of take things that are already in their brand world and, and begin to use them as architectural elements, whether that's a pattern or a texture or um, an enlarged object. Um, or sometimes we get really silly and we just like make a giant ear chair for their customers to take a selfie in. Um, like this as an example of a, a rendering where we were trying to create um, uh, almost like a sort of make you feel very small as if you were the scale of the jewelry when you went into this store. Thank you, that's very inspiring. So um, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is how does the quality of the brand like affect your decision in actually like working with them? Wait, say that again. How does the the quality like of the brand? Oh, the quality of the of the brand, as in like the quality of their products. Yeah, basically. Ha um, like, how does that affect your decision in actually working with them? Hmm. Um, huh. I guess I'm not really sure how to answer that. I mean, you know, I think like every time we work with one of these clients, we end up with a bunch of their products in our houses in our studio just, you know, because we have to get to know them. We have to get really familiar with them. So when we did the Our Place product, project, uh, we went out and got a, a ton of their different pots and pans and, and was really trying to understand how heavy are they, how, um, how does the texture look not online, but like how does it react to light. Um, and I think, you know, that's always really important in our process to get quite familiar with the product. Similarly with Bala. Um, those products, uh, their exercise products, they have a really um, lovely silicone, like super smooth and delicate finish. And so we, you know, in studying that and looking at those products and sort of like thinking about that, we um, took that to our, our mill worker. Often we send the products over to the mill worker and we talk to them about, you know, we're trying to replicate a silicone finish on a piece of mill work and how can we make the color texture super, super matte and the curves like, um, you know, really, really sanded. Um, so yeah, definitely the, the product plays, um, plays a big role. But for example, contact sports, 
is a multi-brand retailer, so they don't have um, they don't have their own product. It's about curating a story that will then house a lot of different other brands. Uh, so, so different clients, you know, some modern age doesn't have products, um, so it was much more about building for their brand instead of uh, instead of a product line. Um, I have two questions. One is that, uh, what is your insight in for having uh, architecture students uh, entering fields that is uh, not architecture, like how you did? And the second is, um, what is the role of social media in uh, your own practice in Ringo Studio? Yeah, great question. So, um, again, I'd say like, so many industries and companies benefit significantly from um, people that come to the table with an architectural uh, education and a way of thinking. I think because of the way that we're educated and the type of academic experience that we have and the type of um, uh, sort of knowledge that we have to gather every time we work on a different product project. If you were designing a winery, you would have to learn everything about wine. If you were designing a healthcare place, you have to learn everything about sanitation. And so I think, um, yeah, I think architects are, or, you know, people educated in architecture are, are really well equipped to hold strong leadership positions in many companies that don't have anything to do with uh, designing physical spaces. Or, again, just being the, the person that allows them to start to have someone who speaks that language within their company. So certainly like a lot of startups, um, you know, they have whole creative teams. And I think even though you've been trained as an architect, you can still participate in art direction and thinking spatially and thinking about how someone experiences a brand. Because, um, yeah, I mean, even if a brand is like only online, eventually the products become physical touch points or the packaging becomes an object that someone receives in the mail. And so it eventually becomes physical for them. And then the second question that you asked, I'm forgetting what it was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of people ask us that um, as well. And um, uh, it's definitely really important, for sure. Um, I'm just going to, like, you know, in some cases, it's like we have a selfie mirror. And it's as simple as that. And it's just a, a mirror and a place for someone to take a selfie and post it online. And that's kind of maybe like, um, the most baseline version of that. And it's the part that over the years has become the least interesting to us when we have a client that comes to us and is like, oh, well, we want to make sure there's a selfie mirror. Um, this was something I kind of perfected when I was at Glossier when, uh, when that experience of going into a store and taking a ton of content was really kind of blowing up in a way for the first time on social media. Um, but now I think that people are using the stores differently and clients are asking less for moments like that. Actually, some clients recently have asked, like, do not design a selfie moment. And I think more so the, the types of things that we're thinking about in terms of social media is how can the brand use the space to create more content for their own brand as opposed to it being other, like, how can customers come in and create content? So, um, for example, like the R Place brand, um, we didn't have room for it in the particular store that we designed, but their future stores will have a space for a cooking class and a space where they can film content while customers are coming in and, and using their products. Or the Bala space is an example of um, a way that they were able to generate social media content um, through influencers that was uh, like multiple degrees more complex than a selfie mirror. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, the social media manager is me, so <laughs> I don't know how to use TikTok. Um, I would really, would really like to hire somebody that is amazing at TikTok. So if anybody has those skills or knows, please reach out. Um, but yeah, I think you know, 
it's it's tricky. I think um, as as a small studio, uh, it's been hard to manage all of those different verticals within the business. I mean, we're just a team of four or five, um, but particularly with our work. Uh, Social media is really important, and these images go online. Uh, the brand publishes them. Um, they get put on the internet from different articles. People take photos in our space. So we do have to participate in the, in the conversation quite a bit. So a lot of that, maybe a lot of that um, is about uh, like sort of using other people's content and reposting it or showing how our work is um, uh, I guess being presented by other people on social media, but yeah, it's a it's a tricky question. I think um, something that I would love to do, but just have never really found the time, is uh, to kind of document more our construction process. I think if we were to ever have a TikTok, it would be like, how do you build a project? And it would be like the content would be like the behind the scenes of like what happens as a project's coming to life. And we've definitely taken a lot of those videos for the purpose of creating a TikTok, but I've never done it. <laughs> so I have a lot of that content ready to go, but it's, by the time it gets published, it's going to be about three years old. And there won't be a TikTok anymore. Thank you so much, Madeline. Um, so I, I know some of you will be in the workshop this weekend, and I guess we can continue the conversation over the weekend. But thank you so much for your presentation.